Good morning, Church. The scripture today is taken from Acts chapter 12, verse 1 to 7 and 12 to 19. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to address Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and sentries before the doors were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and the light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. Verse 12 to 19. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, You are out of your mind. But she kept insisting it was so, and they kept saying, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Liam Pei. Uh, very good morning, everyone. Uh, as you can see or may not be able to see, I have a very fashionable and uh, attractive wet patch on my shirt uh, that has to do with uh, an incident that happened involving my daughter and a water bottle. So, <clears throat> very exciting start to this sermon. Uh, now, just uh, just let you know that next Sunday, as you heard earlier, I believe, or maybe you didn't, yeah, but next Sunday, uh, registration closes for the June mission trips. All right, so next Sunday will be the closing uh, date for registri registering for the June mission trips. Uh, if you're still deciding, you just have this one week to decide whether you're going to be in or not. All right, so I want to give you an update of what's happening with the trips. So uh, I'm firstly happy to announce that our Sri Lanka team is now full, right? So praise God. Uh, yes, praise God. So uh, I believe we are still trying to squeeze in one or two other people who have shown interest. Uh, both the Japan and the KL trips, they just have two spaces left. Uh, so if you are still considering, I encourage you to uh, sign up and register for either of these two trips. Now, unfortunately, the trip to Yangon, Myanmar, will be uh, cancelled. Right? So as many of you know, the situation uh, there is escalating uh, due to the forced military conscription of young Burmese men and women. Uh, the city has become quite unsafe. Uh, young people are staying at home for fear of being uh, you know, grabbed by the military and conscripted on the spot. Uh, there's a lot of fear. So even when we offered to do something um, over Zoom, right, over uh, uh, was it video conferencing, uh, Ong, who is a church planter, he told us that people are just not in the right state of mind uh, to participate in this kind of outreach. Uh, now, Ong is also uh, pleading with us uh, to employ young Burmese people. Now, you know, M Myanmar's military conscription is uh, nothing like our Singapore National Service. All right, uh, we're hearing terrible things about how these young recruits are being used uh, by the military. And so many young Burmese are trying to leave the country. Uh, Ong himself, our church planter, also has a 20-year-old daughter. Um, and he is pleading that if anyone has any work opportunities for his daughter or for uh, other young Burmese, uh, please 
help them get out of Myanmar and possibly save their lives. All right, so in a moment's time, we want to pray uh, for the Christians in Yangon, but I also want to ask that for those of you here who are able to employ young Burmese men and women and you would like to help, uh, would you speak to uh, one of the pastoral staff uh, after the service? Let's pray. Our Father, you are sovereign over all things. Uh, Our hope is entirely in you. Uh, We know that what the enemy means for evil, you are working for good, Lord, even in Myanmar. Lord, we plead for mercy. Uh, We recognize and we know that there are already so few Christians in this land. And by your mercy, would you preserve their lives, Lord? We ask that the young Burmese would become in some ways and many ways, Lord, invisible to the eyes of the military, cause them to be undetectable. Uh, we ask that you open avenues for escape, uh, even to Singapore, through Agapians and others, Lord. Lord, we believe that despite these horrible circumstances, Lord, that the fields are white for the harvest, Lord. So, Lord, would you preserve your laborers, which are already so few, and would you reap the harvest even in a time such as this, Lord. We commit all this to you. We pray also for our trips that, Lord, they will be filled up. And wherever our guardians are being sent, Lord, would you use them to be a blessing. So we commit all this to you. And all of God's people say, Amen. Now, Easter is happening in... A little, uh, it's happening just a few weeks, it's a little earlier than, uh, than usual, so uh, it's the last Sunday of the month, all right? So last Sunday of March is Easter Sunday. Now, Easter has proven to be uh, such a fertile season to reach out to non-Christians, uh, to invite them to church to share about the gospel, right? For some reason, people are just more open to hearing about Jesus and the Christian faith. So uh, in two weeks' time, uh, what we're going to do is that we're going to roll out a couple of platforms. Uh, for non-Christians to engage with the gospel, all right? So two Sundays from now, uh, sorry, two Sundays from now, uh, we'll begin a two-part evangelistic series um, on the topics of guilt and shame. Uh, Guilt and shame, you know, are universal experiences because of sin. Everyone's encountered guilt and shame. Uh, So you're going to, you know, we're going to talk about that and it'll be a great opportunity to invite Uh, your unbelieving loved ones to come and hear about Jesus. So then on Good Friday, uh, like what you heard earlier, uh, we'll be opening our homes to non-Christians to get to know them uh, and to interact with them um, around an evangelistic video that's being prepared. Uh, What we've also found is that there are a lot more non-Christians who turn up at our homes uh, more than those who turn up at our church, right? Which I think makes, is totally understandable. Because, you know, the home setting is a lot less intimidating than coming to a a gathering like this, right? So that's also a precious um, opportunity to invite. And then finally, we also have Easter Sunday, which is going to be evangelistic. Uh, We're going to be talking about hope. Uh, One of our brothers in Agape will be sharing his story, uh, finding hope uh, in Jesus. So again, this is another opportunity to invite. Now, Jesus tells us, like what I prayed earlier, that the fields are white with the harvest. In other words people are far more ready to receive the good news of the gospel than what we think and what we believe. And the issue, many times you find, is that the issue is with us, uh, the laborers, the messengers. Now, recently I went to uh, get my uh, beard trimmed. Uh, I was looking for a cheap barber. I found one. Uh, Just that the shop was quite tiny and the barber looked really young, so I really didn't feel sure, didn't feel safe about this. So I circled around for about 20 minutes looking for some, someone else, but there was no other barber. So with great trepidation in my heart, I returned to that tiny barber shop. Then I realized the barber couldn't really speak English, right? There was this language barrier. Later I found out he's only been in Singapore for about six months. And so after trying to explain what I want uh, to him a few times, I kind of gave up and just like, okay, whatever you want to do, just do lah. Then immediately, without warning, just a Bam, right? He reclined my chair backwards. I was like, Whoa, what's going on? <laughs> then he grabbed a shaver and just like went around all over my face, you know, and, and hair was flying all over so on my eyes, on my nose, on my mouth. And I was thinking, oh man, like I think my beard is gone. Like he's, he's getting rid of all of it, right? And then it just keeps getting better. He, he, was go- he wanted to adjust my face, right? Position my face. So he grabbed my nose and he just like <laughs> tugged it here, there, up and down and all that. I was totally uncomfortable, and I'm thinking to myself, you know what, this is just bad, my beard is probably gone, I'm probably never coming back again. But then he's finished, you know, and then he asked me to have a look if it's okay, and I looked and I thought, wow, for a few dollars, this is not bad. 
And I was pleasantly surprised at the outcome. And I was about to get up and, you know, just pay him and leave. And then he said, wait, wait, sir, haven't finished. So I was like, okay, what else is there to do? So he sits me down and then he starts to give me a shoulder massage and a back massage. And I was like, wow, this is really good. Now, isn't this how evangelism is often like? Right? Before we decide to tell someone about Jesus, we are really unsure. We circle round and round and finally when we decide to go for it, there's great trepidation in our hearts. Everything feels beyond our control. And then we realize there's a language barrier, right? We may be speaking in, in English, right, to that person, person speaking back in English, but we're talking about sin and about God and about salvation. It's like we might as well be speaking another language. And then sharing about Jesus is so uncomfortable, right? People ask questions that you can't answer. Uh, people can become rude. And, you know, this isn't quite what you signed up for. And so you tell yourself, you know what, I'm never going to do this again. But then somehow, something beautiful Something good comes out of it, and it's unexpected. And then you realize all of this is not a waste. All our effort is not a waste. God is doing something in that person's life, and you're like, wow, this is really good. Now, evangelism, talking to people about Jesus, it can be really uncomfortable and really unpredictable, yet we need to press through the discomfort. You know, we need to be the laborers Jesus is looking for, and we need to reap the harvest of souls. So over the next two Sundays, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 12. Now, if you've been in, with Agape for the past few years, you know we've covered Acts chapter 1 all the way to chapter 11. Today, we're going to continue from where we left off, and we're looking at uh, Peter, whom we see is a courageous witness. Now, there are three parts to today's passage, right? Firstly, we see persecution, then we witness prayer and praise, and finally, we see some form of punishment. And what I really want to do is to help us, to help all of us to grow as courageous witnesses. And then as the Easter season comes around, will we also make the most um, of the opportunity that is there? So let's begin. Part one, persecution. Now, I don't know if you felt the same way. Uh, you know, many times when I read the book of Acts, I see how far the Christians go for Jesus. Many times I feel a mix of Wonder and shame, right? Wonder because I, it's like, wow, you know, these Christians are amazing. But shame because I feel like I don't see that kind of courage or that kind of passion in my own life. And I'm wondering, can I be this kind of Christian, right? Can I be so courageous in witnessing for Christ? Can I be so zealous for Jesus? And again, in Acts chapter 12, we see how far the early church and how far the early Christians went for the sake of Jesus. Because for the how many time in the book of Acts, the Christians are again facing persecution. The persecution is violent. This time we are told one of the apostles, James, the brother of John, he's executed. And then the apostle Peter is in prison. And we're told that this time, the person persecuting the church is someone known as Herod the king. Now, if you remember, there was a Herod during Jesus' time. That was Herod the Great. Right? In, in our passage today, we meet his grandson, which is Herod the king. Now, what's really scary about this round of persecution is that it's not a holy war against Christians. Right? You remember Saul. Saul went from house to house arresting Christians. Herod, Herod doesn't have a hot hatred against Christians like Saul did. Herod is doing this purely for political gain. He's persecuting the church because he knows it will please the Jews. It will make them happy. And what that means is that it will increase his influence. And what we see is that Christians can be persecuted for all kinds of reasons. When Saul persecuted Christians, it was personal. His actions flowed from a hot, zealous hatred against Christianity. But when Herod persecuted Christians, it's not personal. It's business. His violence against the church flows from a cold, calculative desire for personal political gain. And here's the thing. If we want to be a courageous witness for Christ, we must be prepared to persevere. Because like Jesus promised us in John 16, in this world, we will have trouble. It's guaranteed. Right? The moment we became Christians, it's like we were reborn into this world 
And as Christians, we are now in a world of trouble. We must expect persecution. We cannot be surprised when people oppose and reject us as Christians for whatever the reason. Persecution is part of the package as Christians. It's, you could say it's part of our legacy. It's part of our heritage. Just as the world hated Jesus and sought to destroy him, this world will reject us as Christians and will seek to destroy our witness. Now, it's perfectly okay, you know, when, when we want to witness, want to share the gospel, and we pray for favor. I think that's fine. You know, we, we want to pray that whenever we share the gospel, it's a smooth experience, you know, that our sharing will happen naturally and organically. We want to pray that, you know, our relationships won't be lost or compromised um, as a result of sharing the gospel. And it's okay to pray for all these things. And God, in His grace, answers such prayers. But we cannot be deceived into thinking that being a witness for Jesus will be easy that it can be effortless, you know, that it'll be without risk, that it'll somehow be well-received in this world of trouble. We shouldn't be deceived into having such unreal expectations because Jesus has told us that for his sake, in this world, you will have trouble. And so we must expect discomfort. We mustn't be surprised when people push back at the gospel. We must be prepared that sometimes our relationships with people could fall apart because of our faithful witness. Now, I'm not saying that therefore we just become rude or insensitive or uncreative or self-righteous in our evangelism. None of that. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that even as we try our best to be loving and tactful when we share the gospel, we must nevertheless still expect rejection, offense, and persecution. We must be ready to persevere. Now, this may sound really disheartening, right? Perhaps some of us are thinking, wow, if it's going to be like that, can I not be a witness for Jesus or not? Right? It just sounds exhausting. I want to point our attention to verse 6, and this is what it says. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out, this is Peter, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. Herod is going to execute Peter in the morning. It's the night before. And you know sometimes when you have exams or you, know, you have a big presentation in the morning, you're so anxious, you're so fearful, you're so worried, you, you just can't sleep. But here's Peter. This might be the last night of his life. He's chained up, there's no way to escape, but he's fast asleep. And it's a picture of peace. right? It's a bit like how the disciples were on the boat and they were struggling with that huge storm and Jesus is just sleeping peacefully in one corner. Right? There's such a peace that is beyond understanding. I mean, if you found out you're going to be executed in the, uh, tomorrow morning, you know, you probably spend the night working your way through the stages of grief. Right? You, you go through denial, you get angry, you start bargaining with God, you fall into depression. And then maybe, right, just maybe, before the morning comes, you may finally come to a place of acceptance. Now, there's nothing wrong with the grieving process. I think it's normal, it's human, it's something we sometimes must go through. But what's amazing is that Peter is totally at rest, right? He's totally at peace. And then we ask, where does he find this peace? Where does does this peace come from? And this brings us to part two. Prayer and praise. Now, Peter was Herod's golden goose, right? Peter was Herod's precious prized possession because Peter was going to bring Herod a lot of favor with the Jews because the Jews really hated Peter, right? They hated him because Peter was this leader of this exploding Jesus cult. And they hated him because Peter, as a Jew, was extending fellowship with the half-blood Samaritans and those filthy Gentiles. And so the Peter had become a threat to the fabric of their society. He was public enemy number one. And so for his own interest, Herod is planning to execute Peter publicly in front of the Jews. But until the execution, Herod is making sure that his golden goose is guarded carefully. So he imprisons Peter. He chains him between two guards. He assigns four squads of soldiers to guard him. And then outside the prison, he stations sentries. Herod did all of this for one Peter. And that's just how important Peter is to Herod. Peter must not escape. But the church is praying. And we're told the church prayed for Peter, 
right? And I believe they surely prayed for his welfare. They prayed that his life would be spared. They probably prayed that Peter would be set free so that Peter could continue to be a witness for Jesus. And we're told the church prays earnestly, which also means that that they are praying for Peter without ceasing. And then God answers their prayers. An angel appears in the prison, flooding the prison cell with light. In verse 7, we're told that the angel whacks Peter on his side, right? I think Peter is so deep asleep that the angel had to smack him awake. And even then, Peter woke up and thought he's still dreaming, right? So I don't know what kind of peace, you know, that Peter had. And the angel tells Peter, get dressed, follow me. And somehow Peter makes it out of prison, right? Maybe the guards were put into a deep sleep. Maybe Peter had become invisible to them supernaturally, but For some reason or another, Peter gets past all of them. And then the front gate, made of heavy iron, swings open of his own accord, and Peter steps out a free man. Then the angel disappears, and Peter realizes, oh, this is all real. It's all happening. And Peter praises God, and he says, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. You see, Herod has plans, the Jews have expectations, but the Lord has salvation. And he rescues Peter, bringing all the schemes, all the wicked desires to nothing, and Peter glorifies God. Then Peter rushes over to a home, his house church, and we realize that the Christians are still praying, very likely still praying for Peter. They are praying earnestly without ceasing. And when they realize Peter has been rescued by God, their prayers turn to praise. Truly, God has heard and answered their prayers. Now, earlier in the first part, I mentioned that to be courageous witnesses for Christ, we must persevere. We must expect persecution, opposition on account of Christ and the gospel. But as G, because as Jesus says, in this world, we will have trouble, so we must persevere. But this second part of our passage tells us that even so, there is hope. There is a source of great peace. And we are called to pray. Because yes, we may live in a world of trouble, but Jesus has overcome this world. Now that's the reason Peter could sleep so peacefully at night before his execution. That's the reason the church did not lose hope, but prayed earnestly without ceasing for Peter. Because Jesus was not only persecuted and put to death, but Jesus rose from the grave and overcame this world. No longer will Jesus subject himself to the rulers of this earth to be humiliated and persecuted. He is king over all. Even death cannot hold him. His authority is higher than any worldly authority uh, authority and goes deeper than even the grave. So even when we are persecuted to death, As servants of this risen king, we can be like Peter, and we can still have peace like a river. And as much as we expect persecution and hardship on account of Christ, we must also expect the timely rescue of Jesus Christ. That in our time of need, especially as his witnesses, Jesus will lavish us with grace and help us overcome. Now, I'm not saying that we'll always have a fairy tale ending whenever we witness for Jesus, at least not on earth. I'm saying that even if we face harsh persecution and it doesn't stop, even so, we can still experience a deep restedness and a deep peace. And people, that's why we've got to be praying. Pray against the fear in our hearts. Pray for courage to triumph over that fear. Pray for peace even if we are persecuted. Pray for God's timely rescue over ourselves and over each other. Pray because Jesus has overcome the world. But I also want us to take our prayer one step further. Would you pray for your loved ones? Would you pray for Singapore? Would you pray for those who do not know Jesus? Now in 1738, uh, Charles Wesley, he wrote a hymn titled, And Can It Be? It's quite a famous hymn. He wrote this hymn shortly after he came to faith and he wrote it to express his wonder that Jesus would save someone like him. Now in the fourth stanza of this hymn, Wesley uses this passage from Acts chapter 12 to illustrate how God rescues us from the prison of sin and condemnation. And this is how it begins. 
Uh, it, it says, long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Wesley says, when we were without Jesus, we were imprisoned, just like Peter. We were shackled and chained, bound to our sinful nature. We had no chance of escape. Then comes the second part. Thine eye diffused the quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flame with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Like Peter, when Jesus came into our lives, it's like he stepped into our prison of sin and darkness, and his presence flooded our sinful hearts with light, and the chains of sin and condemnation fell from our hands, from our feet, from our necks, and we were set free. Our hearts were set free. No more fear of death, no more fear of wrath, no more fear of bondage to sin. And when we arose, we emerged out of that prison and we followed Jesus, our rescuer and our saviour. Now you see, Charles Wesley saw a picture of our salvation in the way that Peter was imprisoned and rescued. And the truth is, salvation itself is God's timely rescue. Everyone on earth is spiritually imprisoned, chained, bound, and slaved under the power of sin. And when the morning comes, all of us should rightfully be put to death by the true and just king. But in his mercy, this king has sprung a prison break. And we need to pray that Jesus would break our loved ones and the lost around us out of this spiritual prison. That he would free them from the chains of sin and lead them out of darkness so that when the morning comes, instead of ex experiencing the execution, they can walk in newness of life. And because Jesus has overcome the world, not just the principalities over the world, but also the wickedness of the sinner's heart in the world, we pray. He has overcome, so we pray. And now people, as Easter comes around and we are in this opportune season of outreach, I want to invite us. Would you join me? Would you join one another to dedicate uh, the month of March just to be praying daily for your unbelieving loved ones? Pray for their salvation. Pray that they would experience this supernatural rescue by Jesus. Pray for them by name. Share those names with your cell group so that we can be praying alongside one another. Pray for the lost in Pekyo. Pray for the lost in Singapore. And where possible, make it a point to pray for those by name, every day. Pray for their salvation. And would you do that at least for the remainder of the month of March? And then let's see how the Lord will overcome as he answers our prayer. Now we come to the final part of our passage. It's punishment. The morning comes. Peter's missing. There's an uproar. The soldiers are thrown into confusion. The guards are afraid. If Peter is not found, there will be consequences. Herod the king, he hears the news and he launches a search uh, for his golden goose. But Peter can't be found. Then Herod examines the guards, interrogates them, and finally he punishes those guards with death. Now this feels like a bittersweet ending to our story. Because on one hand, these soldiers deserved it. Right? They were involved in Herod's persecution. They supported the killing of James. They participated in this conspiracy to murder Peter. And their death is God's divine justice. But at the same time, did these soldiers really need to die? Couldn't God have rescued Peter in such a way that would spare the lives of these soldiers? Because it feels like they were paying the consequences for Peter's escape. And then we think, you know, these guards are probably not Christian. So their death would have been an eternal death. Now, isn't that pretty harsh? Now, what we are seeing here is not just God's divine justice. It is also the hardness of the sinful heart. You know, Peter was in prison for anywhere between a couple of days to an entire week. And what this means is that the soldiers had days to benefit from Peter's witness. Now, I imagine Peter would not have stopped praying. Uh, Peter would have not stopped singing. He would have not stopped sharing the gospel with these guards. Uh, the guards would have seen Peter's faithfulness, his hope, his tenacity, his fervor for the Lord. And they would have witnessed his extraordinary peace. Yet there seems to be no indication that the soldiers came to faith. 
And when Peter escapes, despite all the security measures, despite all their vigilance, the guards don't say, oh, this must be Peter's God. They don't turn in fear to Jesus and repent of their wicked ways. Instead, they fear Herod. They fear Herod's punishment. You see, the soldiers' hearts remained hardened in sin. And we can say the same of Herod himself. He persecuted the church. He executed the apostle James. He made plans to execute Peter. And when Peter escapes Herod's plans, you know, it all falls apart spectacularly. His golden goose got away. His military became a laughingstock. They could even safeguard one prisoner. And for all the hype that he had generated about, you know, publicly executing Peter before the Jews, ultimately he failed to deliver. And at, at this point, Herod has an opportunity to repent. Not only has he been spectacularly humiliated, he has been supernaturally humiliated. If Herod would only humble himself, he would see how he has sinned against God. But instead, Herod tries to save face. He places the blame on the guards, and then Herod runs away to another region. It's called Caesarea. Herod's heart remained hardened in sin. Instead of repenting in humility, he clings to his pride. Now people, this large, last portion, it teaches us pity. Because this is a world in deep trouble. And we'll talk more about that next Sunday. But here we see that there will be times that despite our faithful witnessing, despite our best efforts, despite how persuasive or how loving we are, despite the miracles and answered prayers that are seen, there will be people who will still reject Jesus. And people, there's such a hardness to the sinful heart. And this is why Jesus, when he was hanging on the cross, he cried out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. You see, our sin makes us think that because we're so cynical, we're very clever. Yet cynicism itself is the fool's path to destruction. Sin makes us believe that our lack of commitment to God, our ambiguity to God, makes us very open-minded. In reality, our minds are fatally shut to the realities of God. Sin leads us to believe that because, just because we have a couple of questions, a couple of doubts, then therefore we're being very learned and very knowledgeable by rejecting Jesus. In reality, we are blind to an obvious kind of knowledge that is foundational to all life in creation. And the Jews who crucified Jesus, you know, they believed they were serving God, that they were doing the right thing, that they were protecting the fabric of the society by eliminating Jesus. But they didn't realize how far their sins were taking them, the lengths to which they had gone for their sins. They didn't understand the gravity of their actions, the depths to which their sin was plunging them. They were not careful to look up and see the heights of God's wrath gathering over their heads like a storm. And Jesus saw all of this and he saw how deceived they were by the hardness of their sinful hearts and he had pity on the very people who were putting him to death. Now people, we too ought to have that deep sense of pity towards those who reject Jesus. We were just like them, no different. And this pity should fuel our perseverance. It should overwhelm the fear of rejection because, you know, that the fear of rejection because they're not rejecting us. They're rejecting Jesus. And they just don't get the lengths, the depths, the heights of what they're doing. So we persevere for them. But this pity should also fuel our prayer. We should bow our knees before the Father, pleading that according to the riches of His grace, through the power of His Holy Spirit, Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith, so that the lengths of their sins might be surpassed by the lengths of God's mercy, that as far as the east is from their west, their sins might be removed from them, so that the depths of their sins might be filled and covered by the depths of Christ's righteousness, that righteousness that is now theirs in Christ, if only they would believe in Him so that the heights of God's wrath against them might be satisfied by the heights of His grace. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the measure of our Father's everlasting love. And so we continue to pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, where does this pity come from? How can the fears in our heart turn into pity? What hope is there for us 
in all the cowardliness that we see in our own hearts, to become courageous witnesses. Now, tucked away in our passage today is this weird little story, this weird little account of Peter and Rhoda, who is a servant girl. Peter has been just, you know, he's just got out of prison and he finds his house church. He knocks on the door. He says, hey, it's me. It's Peter. I'm the follower of Jesus. Please let me in. But instead of letting Peter in, Rhoda, the servant girl, runs into the church, into the house and tells everyone, Peter's here. Peter's here. And even though they've been praying for Peter, they just don't believe her. But Rhoda insists, it is Peter. Peter, the follower of Jesus, he's here. He's at the door. And then finally, they just go out and they check and behold, it's Peter. Now we read this account and we smile a little bit. And then we move on with the rest of of Acts chapter 12. And we kind of wonder like, what a weird little story. I wonder why it's in the Bible. Why why is it so important that it has to be put in? And in all its detail. And it's as if the author of the book of Acts wants to remind us that Peter wasn't always this courageous witness we now know him to be. Because there was a previous incident that's so similar. It involved Peter and a servant girl, and that servant girl was equally insistent that Peter was a follower of Jesus. But at that time, Peter went to such lengths to deny Jesus, to say he didn't know Jesus, that he had nothing to do with this Jesus. And it's like the author of Acts is telling us, do you remember that Peter? That cowardly Peter? that lousy witness of a Peter, do you see how much he's changed? Do you see how far he's come? And don't you see that even if you're the most cowardly, you're the most self-preserving, if you're the never step out of your comfort zone kind of Christian, that there is still hope. That like Peter, you can be absolutely transformed. That your fear can turn to courage. That your silence can be replaced with a persistent witness. That your self-pity can be replaced with a genuine pity for the lost, for those who do not know Jesus. And it's as if the author of Acts is telling us, don't you see how Peter changed? Because after Peter denied Jesus, Jesus died for Peter, forgave Peter of his cowardice. Then Jesus rose to life and the power of fear was broken over Peter. And after Jesus went to the Father, then came the day of Pentecost. And Jesus baptized Peter in the Holy Spirit. And Peter was filled with boldness and compassion and pity for the lost. Don't you see? Peter was transformed not by anything he did, but by grace and by grace alone. People, would you come to the Lord this morning with humility? Don't cling to your pride like Herod. Don't say this is who you are, this is how you'll ever be, and this is all you can do. You know, we're all guilty of denying Jesus in some way or another. We're all guilty. But Jesus died for your unfaithfulness and your cowardice and your self-pity. Your sins are forgiven. They are remembered no more. Jesus rose to life so that the power of fear may be broken. And you no longer have to live in bondage to that fear. And Jesus has baptized you in his Holy Spirit. There is power and boldness and a new heart that is now yours. You can grow in that godly pity. You can be earnest and unceasing in prayer. You can persevere even when there's opposition. And you know what? We'll continue to fail in our evangelism, right? There'll be times we'll be given to fear. There'll be times we pity ourselves and make excuses for ourselves when our pity should be for the lost and our pleas should be for God to rescue them. We'll fail, continue to fail for sure. But because we're not depending on ourselves, not on our willpower, not on our ability to be better, to improve, to to do better, but we're completely dependent on Jesus and on the grace he gives, then we will rise again in repentance as faithful witnesses. Because in Jesus, there is hope. There is always hope. And by the grace of God, cowards like Peter, like you and me, we can become courageous witnesses. Let's pray. Our Father, we recognize just the depths of your love for this world, Lord. Lord, the way in which you pluck sinners as they walk down that path 
to eternal fire and flame and destruction. Surely, Lord, you have a mercy that we can never comprehend. As your grace has abound towards us, so will your grace surely abound towards those around us as well. Father, we come in repentance and we ask again, Lord, that you would forgive us where our fear has crippled us, where our fear has defined our evangelism, rather than a sense of perseverance, Lord, rather than a sense of peace. Father, we pray that you forgive us also that for being so caught up in what we need to say to people rather than how we should approach you to say many more things, Lord, in prayer. Forgive us for thinking that, Lord, it's up to us that we are the saviors of the world. We are not, Lord. Father, forgive us also for that self-pity that we have nurtured and Lord, you know our difficult circumstances. You know how hard life is, how weary we are. And yet it feels like just at those points when we are so like depleted and drained and we are tired from work or whatever it is, at that moment, you give us an opportunity to reach out to someone, Lord. And how many times we have failed, Lord. We've looked at that, at that opportunity and we've said, Lord, I can't do it. I'm just too tired, Lord. I, I, I can't, Lord. And the pity overwhelms ourselves, Lord, when our pity should have been directed to them, Lord. When will they have another chance to hear? What if this is an opportunity that, Lord, you are going to do something in their life? And surely no effort done in your name is wasted, Lord. Forgive us, Father. Lord, we pray again and ask that you fill our hearts with hope, Lord, that as you rescued and transformed someone like Peter, so gutsy yet so cowardly, Lord, would you do the same with us, Lord? Grant us peace in the midst of our, our persecution. Grant us thanksgiving in the midst of our trials. Lord, our hope is in you. It's in your Son, our Savior, for all his suffering, for all his saving, and for all his all-surpassing ability to save, Lord. Lord, we pray and we ask that you sustain our witness. We pray that you sustain our praying even for the month of March, Lord, as we want to dedicate each day to pray for people by name, pray for the lost, pray for Pekio, pray for Singapore, Lord. We want to do that in, in our own uh, private spaces. We want to do that in our cell groups. We want to do that with our families. Lord, would you hear us, Lord, and sustain our prayerfulness before you, Lord. We pray also you, that eventually you will turn our prayer to praise, Lord, when we see you answering our prayers in the most unexpected, the most un amazing ways, Lord. We commit all of this to you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.